The Sentinel is known to be reliable, fearless, disciplined, consistent, courageous, motivated, and skillful. So do what you feel passionate about. Take chances. All these qualities start from the mind. Your mind can be your worst enemy or your most powerful weapon. The world becomes your library to help you become better at your craft. Is this the dagger? Learn how to achieve greatness and tap into the Sentinel Mindset. Let's go! Well, good morning, everyone, on this <laughs> wonderful, beautiful day today. This is going to be a very special, special episode. I mean, turn off everything that you have right now. You wouldn't want to listen to this. We have Mubin Sheikh in the house. Yeah, Mubin Sheikh is actually an ex-extremist. Um, Yes, he w actually was an extremist at some point in his young years, and now he's actually a former counter-terrorism uh, operative. What that means is the intel that he gained by actually being on the inside, seeing ISIS get birthed and uh, kind of being in the mix of Al-Qaeda, Al -Qaeda, he's actually used that for CSIS and for the RCMP to work to help stop terrorism in Canada. Yes, and if, if you can just go back, if you remember where you were for 9-11, uh, and and the, the the things that led up to that, I can tell you, Mubin did because it was 9/11 that caused him literally to shift his world and make change for the better. As it did for so many people, I'd say this. He actually, there's a spy museum in Washington D.C. that actually has a, a whole wall featuring Mubin and some of the elements that he did to bring down um, terrorism in our nation. So, man, like, get that shawarma out. <laughs> Okay, get ready. Yes. Pizza. I, I didn't mean that as any cultural thing. I just yes. I love shawarma. Yes. And this is an amazing podcast. Uh, we, uh, as we always say, we're just scratching the surface, but we think Mubin, he was an incredible guest. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, good morning, everyone, on this beautiful Friday morning. We got in the house, Mubin Sheikh. And who is Mubin? Mubin is a former undercover counterterrorism operative for the Canadian Security Intelligence Service. Did I say that right? All right? Uh, all right. CSIS. CSIS. CSIS for those. For those that uh, need help on identifying what that stands for. <laughs> for the peasants. But thanks for coming on board, man. Yeah, thanks I for having really me. really appreciate you coming down. Thanks for having me. Good, man. Yeah. Good. I mean, uh, that's a lot that I threw in there. I'm probably thinking, what the heck is a form undercover counter? Like, I mean, it's a lot. Um, just to kind of get about, where did you grow up? What area? Uh, okay, I grew up, I guess, my earliest years, uh, Caledonia, Caledonia, and Lawrence, let's say. Okay. It was a place called The Village. Okay, uh, nice. Building complex, townhouses surrounding it. Nice. Uh, yeah, uh, so yeah, basically Caledonia and Lawrence, and uh, I pretty much stayed in that same area, so former city of York. Okay. I mm -hmm. guess, what okay. they call it now. Yeah. Toronto now. Yeah, Toronto, yeah, it's, 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 it's changed. <laughs> I mean, you've always had always had a four one six area code. That's right? right. Or I mean, you probably were there, were there before you actually had to type in four one six. As soon as you said four one six, I I flashed back to the rotary phones. Yes, exactly. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> Crazy. Okay, so Toronto, born and bred. Love the hat too. Yes, of yes, course. yes. Representing my gang signs. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. Our gang sign. Our. Oh, I like that. That's right. Hey, that's actually a good T-shirt. Canada flag, our gang sign. Yeah. <laughs> right? He's all about t-shirts. He's all about always yeah, putting something on a t-shirt. I know. That's, I, I realize that. Yes. Okay, okay. so um, so for the, for people that don't know you, I know you've been heavily on television. Mm. You know, uh, Mubin speaks to anything in terms of national security. He's one of the voices that speak to homeland security, specific to terrorism and how it affects people. Um, that is definitely not your average run-of-the-mill job. No. You might have a cubicle, and you might make the cubicle like a beautiful place to work in. I'm just saying, I don't know. I don't know. But uh, give us an idea. What, what's it like to do what you do? Well, uh, it's it's not in a cubicle. Okay. So <laughs> what I do or what I did. Yeah. Um, basically, the way the security uh, Canadian Security Intelligence uh, Service works is obviously there are a bunch of different. Uh, functions, right? Um, basically, the main functions are collection and analysis, right? So the analysts are really in the cubicles or okay. uh, really like, I mean, very intellectual, academic approach to, uh, you know, like, uh, so whatever the collectors bring in, uh, that information, the analysts will then process and whatever. Mm -hmm. So I fall into the collection side. Um, 
uh, I'm the undercover. So even a CSIS intelligence officer doesn't do what I do. Right? What I do is I sit next to the bad guy who thinks I'm his buddy and part of his group. And I have to pretend um, that I'm one of them. Mm-hmm. And uh, and that's that's that basically was my life for a number of years. Uh, various uh, you know different groups may, might be an individual that the service has targeted for uh, elimination. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> we don't do that. Yeah. Uh, no, but has has, tar- <laughs> has targeted them for uh, uh, you know for for whatever reason, right? And and I'm never told you know what information this the service has on that person. I am sent in as an independent eyes and ears verification, you know, system, if you will. So they know that, you know, uh, target number one has been doing X, Y, Z. Now, I don't know that. So, but they need, you know, uh, uh, 100% proof that this is, in fact, what this person is doing. Hmm. It could be that, you know, people are making anonymous phone calls to the service. And thank God that we live in a country that anonymous phone calls don't qualify as evidence so when the service starts to look into it and they say wait a second we have human sources out there that are you know listening in or whatever else let's say eyes and ears and they're also saying that this guy showed up at this place so we want to know who this guy is exactly and what they're doing so they'll send in somebody like me to to get in to try to infiltrate the individual's network or the group whatever and confirm or deny what the service knows and so okay. the, mm. it, w- can't do that from behind a desk. Yes, that's right. The co- a collector. Yeah, that sound, That is a Netflix. So, so that, that's that, the, that's a title for yeah. a Netflix. Series, I like that. Right. I like that. The collectors. I mean, because I mean, that's just how you handle the information. Yes. And it's all off right. intel. I'm yeah. Curious. You were saying anonymous phone calls, how it's not used as evidence, and how that's a that's a great thing. Why? Well, because you need to be able to verify, you know, accusations and claims. I mean, I'll give you a great example. This is something that stuck with me, and, you know, has stuck with me, and and will will never leave just because of. So, you know, there was this uh, Muslim guy, Muslim Imam, uh, who uh, people somebody called about him, and they said this guy is a Taliban supporter, and. I know the guy, and I was like, mm, "That's I don't I don't believe that. That that can't be. I need to see more proof of that." They're like, "Well, you know, can you find out?" And blah blah blah. So, anyways, long story short, it turned out it had nothing to do with Taliban. It were it was other Muslim people in the community who were jealous of the money this guy was making because he ran this Arabic program and made it very uh, user friendly, which a lot of them couldn't do. So just out of pure jealousy, they called the service, right? Mm. So, so it's things like that. that to put them on the radar to of put the them service, on the radar. obviously yeah. with intention yeah. to, yeah. okay, so to use the system against him. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, oh, so, man. So that, okay. that, that's stuff that's happening in the present, Yeah. Right? So if we go back, back in time, what kind of like, I mean, reading some of the notes here, <laughs> uh, you know, what kind of. Like how do you like, yeah? Which course in uh, at Seneca did you take to get into? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, 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 how Shout did, out to Seneca Sting. That, <laughs> to go to the origin stories, like how did how did this all get into place? Like how did you, mm-hmm. uh, you know, look to be like man, the jihad? I'm gonna mm-hmm. jump into that. I'm gonna I'm gonna like what what? How did that start? At what age? Yeah. So uh, I'm like I said, I'm born and raised here in Toronto, Canada, um, and uh, you know, coming from Indian background and. Uh, you know, my my parents came here early '70s, uh, and if you if you kind of follow the post um, uh, post World War II independence movements, uh, you know, especially India and Pakistan, right? Looking at that region in particular, uh, the Brits were of course uh, all over that place, and you know, as early as the '60s, you started to see people uh, from India going over to Britain. U.S., Canada, and my father was in that group that went in the early 70s. Now, it, my grandfather was a police officer in India uh, who also did undercover work and whatnot, so it is literally in the blood. Wow, okay, uh, that, that's incredibly rare. Yeah. That's amazing. He sent my dad to the U.K. to live with his uncle. So my dad grew up in the U.K., was you know studying there, uh, got a telecommunications job in Canada, Bell Canada, of course, 
uh, came here, I was born. Now, what they do is they tend to replicate a lot of what they do back home, quote unquote, in the countries that they come to because that's all they know. Mm. So one of the things they set up was an Islamic school and a, and a madrasa, they call it, right? Madrasa just in Arabic means place of study, right? But madrasa is used as in our understanding. If you think about in, in, in Afghanistan, Pakistan, where kids are sitting on the floor, uh, wooden benches, rocking back and forth, reading the Quran, not understanding a word of what they're saying. So that's what I was put into. Uh, I went to public school by daytime, of course, and it was a complete opposite, right? The Quran school was tough. I mean, you got beats, you got shots. Uh, they put you in stress positions. Boys and girls separated. Wow. You know, only one cultural community represented. Go to public school, boys and girls mixing, caring, nurturing environment. So this starts to lay the foundation for an, an identity crisis that would hit me later on in my life. Mm -hmm. okay. And when I got to high school, uh, actually, I joined the Army Cadets. I was in the Cadets for five years. Um, and also the peer group that I had in high school. So we, pre we pretty much ran that high school, all right? Like, I, I, I love this. I, you know, I love even telling this part of the story because I wasn't bullied. I wasn't picked on. I wasn't the victim of racism. Right. We were the cool kids of school, right? Mm -hmm. We ran that school. And uh, what happened is I had a house party. Uh, while my parents were out of town and unfortunately and unbeknownst to me my dad had asked his brother to check on the house while he was gone <laughs> yeah. so in the middle of the party literally in the middle of the party the door flies open it's like a raid you know and it's my uncle and he's like the mean muslim dude right like yeah. scowling face beard robe scar oh yeah yeah and the, uh, the mean muslim yeah. dude yeah, yeah. <laughs> It was it was bad. Oh, so man. it basically what happened was it, I was just overcome with shame and guilt, mm -hmm. and that told you know and I basically told myself, look, I need to get super religious, and that's how I'm going to salvage my reputation, right? It's sort of like how people become like born again or mm -hmm. whatever. So that was like a defining moment for you. Yeah, it absolutely was. Yeah. Wow. Because uh, my I mean, you know, as a high school student, whatever, this cool kid like. So my, Oh, my reputation is ruined not ruined but yeah it kind of added a whole other level of coolness to the party right like when when a member of the you know parents you know rushes the house yeah but so basically the, so, the, so the party officially ended from that day i guess yeah yeah, yeah i did yeah. yeah it just i felt i felt really ashamed and embarrassed and you know my 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 life kind of crashing down on me so basically what i what i said is i'm gonna go on this religious trip to india and pakistan Two months in India, two months in Pakistan. This is uh, the summer of 1995. Okay. Uh, were you guys born then? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Come on, man. Oh, I, I was driving. What a compliment, dude. I, I was driving. Like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just started driving that year. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so 95, I go to India and Pakistan. And, okay, uh, how, how old are you right now, 95? 43. You're, no, no, but in 95. Oh, and, uh, so, so 90, you well, been September is my birthday, so I was, good. Yeah. I was 19, yeah. yeah. Okay. Because then I turned 20 when I got back. Okay, so you're 19 right now. Okay. I'm 19. I go to India, Pakistan. India is fine, you know. Go get to Pakistan. They send us to a city called Quetta. Okay. Now Quetta, for those who do know that, even in the '90s, was the headquarters or the the a stronghold of the Taliban. So the, one did, of the did you know this going into? I that? didn't know this. No. So you're walking in blindly. I'm, I'm walking. I'm about blind. to get an education in Quetta. You got, you got your yeah. Sony Discman. You went to HMV. <laughs> yeah. You loaded up Walk your, with, with the cassette right. player. Yeah. The cassette yeah. player. That's yeah. right. I don't even think we're allowed to bring those. Uh, <laughs> wow. I think you could, but they had to be religious things only. <laughs> yeah. Are you nervous at this point that I'm going right now into foreign lands, new experiences? I, I, what, like, what are you feeling? I'm, I'm, yeah. Well, so because my family is Indian, I had gone to India. I okay. mean, uh, at least a couple of times before right. before this trip, but it was to see family, right? Yes. And it was always in comfortable right. and and familiar environments. Uh, this was not that, right? This was with strangers uh, and places I had never gone. Definitely not with family. Wow. You know, you're staying in the mosque. It's a very austere way of living. Right. Um, because you're, you know, you're living in the mosque. You're sleeping on the floor. There's yes. no. Your shower is a is a is a bucket like a pitcher that you're scooping out of a bucket wow. and you know bathing yourself with like that's right. how you bathe right and uh oh my god you know the toilets jeez yeah you know because like the squatting ceramic toilets yes. and like 
it's just like disgusting you know man like yeah. it's one thing being in the west <laughs> and in the bathroom where you have air fresheners and yeah. exhaust fans <laughs> exactly. and you don't have that it is like <laughs> you know disgusting heat first of all right yes and then you just like you can can i say shit yeah, yeah oh, of yeah. course man just Let it all out. shit smells you know yeah. what i mean just yeah. wall of shit as soon as you get into that bathroom so yeah and everything, every surface is sticky. Oh, man, it's just... And I got really sick. Like, everyone gets, like, this intestinal amoeba type thing. Yeah, it's yeah. like this... You got to go through. It's like four days, five days of oh just hell. It runs wow. its course. You it, have to, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it does, right? So, so I mean, you know, in that <laughs> in that respect, it was like, uh, you know, it was what it was. Um, but, but mainly, it was uh, ending up in Kuwaita and having this chance encounter with the Taliban. Because the way it worked is we would go around the local area, inviting the local Muslim population there to the mosque, right, for prayers and f- to hear our lectures that we were going to give in the mosque. So um, as I was walking around the local area, I could see from the distance, uh, you know, there were there were other bearded, turban-robed men. And so I thought, oh, these, you know, just these are fellow tabligis, like fellow Jamaat people or mm-hmm. Muslim people. So I went, we went, I went over and I had a translator with me and then I realized very quickly that these guys are not shop owners. They had rocket propelled grenades, AK-47, belts of ammunition. And so because I was in the army cadets, I know what that, what that is, right? I knew what that was. And so I was, I was enamored by them. Right, right? Yes. like 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 this is cool. This is cool. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah, because think about it. As uh, a, especially this, as a contrast to the shopkeeper. Right. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah. But, and yeah. and especially as this young Muslim kid looking for this new identity, mm. especially one that is rooted in religion. Yes, you know, coming from this complete one eighty, yeah. this this was like this was everything for me. Right, right. Yeah. so because it represented a power seat, you know, yeah. in in this new room, right? Yeah. Uh, it's interesting. I, I kind of caught me off when you said that because I always say in hindsight that it was that n- that notion of belonging to this greater cause and this greater group. And when you're coming from a, a sense of powerlessness and you move into something extreme that gives you a sense of power, it's very easy for people to latch on to that. This is really what we call this process of radicalization. Mm-hmm. That's exactly what it is. It's where people become increasingly extreme in their views. And there are reasons, like there are, you know, cognitive openings that, that cause that. A cognitive opening in, you know, radicalization discourse is anything that basically makes you uh, receive ideas that you would not normally be receptive to. Mm-hmm. So take for example when 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 somebody uh, someone in your family dies, if there's ever a time that people find God, or purpose in their life, or right. lose purpose in their life, right. it's that. Yes, that's an example of that, right? Yeah. And it, something that's so so uh, traumatic to your system that you begin to now become receptive to other views that previously you wouldn't be receptive yeah. to. Or even it's always out. it's always like what I used to hear was uh, if you're an atheist, for example. Mm-hmm. And I've heard this example. You, you're, you're an atheist, and you're on a plane, and there's turbulence, <laughs> like really hard turbulence. Oh God! Says, God, God, God! You know what I mean? It's like you, call, you call out to the God you don't believe, right? right, right it's right. funny how you just, that's the first thing that kind <laughs> of popped so into true. my head. That's so you know? true. Well, they say there's no atheists in, in the foxhole. Yeah, exactly, right? mm. exactly. Um, but uh, but yeah, so I, I I met them. I became very enamored by them. Uh, I liked their their narrative of you know you have to be a strong Muslim. You know, you have to be militant. You got to be hardcore, right? You got to let everyone know that you are, right? Like, it was like an in-your-face Muslim, right? right? Um, so I came back in the fall of 95. Uh, Taliban come to power in Afghanistan. I see this on TV. I'm like, holy crap. Like, it's I crazy. met these people. Yeah. Like, they did what they said that they were going to do. Yeah. And I took it as a validation of their ideology. Yeah. And so I fell into deeper into that ideology. Uh, basically, this part goes from basically, let's say, 1996 to 2001. And in these years is when I was very uh, militant, always talking about, uh, you know, fighting the Kufar, the non-Muslims. And not just any non-Muslim, but you had to be like hostile combatants, right, mm-hmm. against 
1996 uh, is when the Russians invaded Chechnya. And there was a big uh, civil conflict that happened there. And so that was the place that I w wanted to go to fight as a foreign fighter, hmm. uh, to fight the Russians with these jihadists who were over there. Um, 1996 is also uh, the first, uh, I think it was the first bombing by a guy by the name of Osama bin Laden. Might have heard of him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so this was happening around that same time. Yeah. Now, just as a side note, well, it's more of a side note, but as my journey, my, my trajectory is on this incline and increase, I, I got married to this girl that I knew from high school. Back uh, home? No, no, here in Toronto. Okay, okay. Yeah. And uh, she's Polish. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right? Hey, hey. That's right. <laughs> I'm, half, I'm half Polish. Oh, okay. Yeah, well, yeah. Now we're related now. There yeah. you go. <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, I went to high school with her. Uh, we all hung out together, this and that. And then I went away and got super religious and came back. And then she got interested in me, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, really by the grace of God that I don't know how I, why I even like proposed to her. But it was in the middle of this like theological debate. Uh, I think she was reading a book on Hindu philosophy called Raja Yoga by a very famous uh, Hindu philosopher, uh, Vivekananda. And... Um, and so we were just kind of like half debating whatever and I basically just said to her I was like you know if your views were a little different I would propose marriage to you she, she was just completely taken aback and then we kind of sat and talked and she's like okay yeah I'll do it and I'm just like what did I just hear her say that wow. yeah yeah it was a crazy uh, really really by the grace of God because uh, I don't know man but 20 years later right we have five kids Yes, wow. yes, we're done. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and um, so I got married in 98, and then I went on this crazy honeymoon trip, like to Saudi Arabia, uh, to Mecca and Medina, the two holy sites, to Egypt, did the tourist thing around the pyramids and the Sphinx. Uh, went into Israel slash Palestine yeah. uh, through the Rafah border yeah. uh, by, uh, by in the Sinai, I guess. And... Um, uh, did the tour, you know, Holy Land tour there, you know, watched the sunrise from Masada, uh, was at the Western Wall. Really, really great experience. Now, this is pre-9-11. You don't have a picture of me from what I used to look like. Maybe we'll, uh, I'll give you one a little yeah. bit later. But yeah. Yeah. I had a giant beard, uh, black Taliban turban, long robes. Like, I looked the part. Wow. Now, this is pre-9-11. So, yes, yes. You know, <laughs> showing up at the Israeli border looking like that uh, today might be a little more difficult. But yes. I didn't have any problems, you know, I had a Canadian passport, I have, I'm not Arab, so I think, you know, that's really where their concerns come from most mm -hmm. of the time. Um, and then went to India and finished off, went to the Taj Mahal and did the tourist thing there. So so that calmed me down a lot, mm -hmm. uh, but it didn't completely take me out of that, that, that discourse, if you will, that jihadist discourse. And it would, it would take an event like 9-11 to do that. So let me ask you this. When you're, before the whole 9-11 thing happens, okay, are you acknowledging that there's something just doesn't feel right about what I'm doing? Or does it feel right to you at the time? It does feel right at the time. Okay, what about the, your, the, your family and friends? What are, what, what are they thinking while you're in this? Because sometimes it's the people on the outside that have a better view, right? We're in the box, in the bubble, and something, oh, what, what is their perception of everything? Yeah, I think... Uh I think some of them thought I was going through a phase. Right, like getting a tattoo at the age of 40 kind yeah. of thing. <laughs> yeah, uh, I think they thought, uh, you know, this guy is going to get over it. You know, he'll come back down to earth and be normal. Um, but are they, are they looking at it as a negative thing? Or more of like, what's he doing? You know, that kind of thing. Yeah, I think they really didn't know how to see it. Because it, for a lot of Muslim parents, like when they see that their kid is more religiously observant, mm. it's a good thing. Right. right? And, 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 you know, for all intents and purposes, it is, right? Like somebody becoming religious, uh, suddenly very religious, is not a warning sign, right? I mean, this happens often and across religions. Mm. But it's when you join that with hateful rhetoric, you know, uh, uh, the, what do you call it, inclining towards violent action, then then that sudden change is a warning sign, right? Okay. Because there are aggravating factors now associated with that. Now, And they could see that because my rhetoric had started to increase. Um, you know, talking about going to fight in Chechnya was definitely a warning sign to them. Mm -hmm. So so they were, they were a bit worried, 
they definitely were, but I don't think they thought that I would do anything uh, drastic. Okay. Which okay. I didn't. Okay. Mm-hmm. Out of curiosity, just this popped to my head. You're doing this for a couple of years. Do you get paid to do this? What, doing what? Uh, when you were in the jihad. No, no. I just, oh, uh, no. So no. so they take care of you, basically. They, they take care of your food, your accommodation. If, oh, so, well, two things. So one is, like, the group that I went to, to India and Pakistan, they are not... They are not an extremist group. They are a fundamentalist group, um, and it just it it just it just so happened that I went with them, and had this meeting with the Taliban. So the group that I went with are legit. Okay. They are fundamentalists. I mean, I'll be straight about that. But fundamentalist doesn't necessarily mean extremist, right? Yes. Like they might not shake hands with women. Yes. Yes. Because they like to keep separate from people or whatever. That's fine. You want to be like that, all right? Uh, but they're they're not extreme. So in the in that group, uh, you pay your own way. Okay. Right. Uh, and then when I got back and I was just hanging around with these guys, that this was there was no money involved in that. Like we weren't, you know, we weren't, we didn't need to spend money. Right. So. Okay. So, man. So you have this journey. You have this experience. Okay. And then you said you just kind of finished it right up until nine eleven. Yeah. So nine eleven happens. First of all, do you have which any... Changed, which changed the world. Yeah, which changed the okay. world. Literally, everything from security measures yeah. to now have to take my belt off and shoes at the airport. Like, yeah. it's, it's changed the world right now. Prior to that point, are you? is there any indications right now that things are going to pop off? Is there any messages going out there right now that are like... You know, it, at the time when you look back, oh, man, when I heard that, it could mean this. Is there anything all happening in this world? Yeah, were you privy to like a storm that was brewing that the general public wasn't leading up to 9-11? I think, I mean, that's a good question. Was I don't know if I was privy to it. I think I was part of it, okay, in one sense because wow. it was that build up, right? It was, uh, you know, uh, Bin Laden's fatwa against the Jews and Crusaders uh, that started everything off, right? And then the bombings in Kenya and Tanzania mm-hmm. uh, that that escalated even more. And then this fighting that was happening in Chechnya, these were uh, places for you know, uh, physical jihad that people could look at, or Muslims could be looking at and saying, this is what we want to see more of. And then 9-11 happens. Wow. And then everything just gets, you know, put to a whole other level. Right. So, uh, you know, Tuesday morning, right? I'll never forget that day because uh, I was working yeah, at an wow. uh, office building and uh, I heard on the radio the first plane hitting the building. And... Uh, I'll be honest, I actually felt a little bit of uh, elation, you know, because the kuffar, quote-unquote, you know, the infidels, if you will, uh, they got what was coming to them, right? And uh, it's crazy because I remember uh, many, many years later, obviously, uh, I gave a a talk on the anniversary of 9-11 in a church. And I talked about how when I, like I just said, when I heard the plane hit, I thought, you know, okay, well, you know, the U.S. got what it deserved. Um, and thinking, though, that it was an accident, not that it was a deliberate terrorist attack, right? Yeah. And it was crazy because at the end of that church talk, a woman came up to me and says, you know what, my husband said the same thing that you yeah. just said. Yeah. So it was it was just that, that, that sentiment that people mm-hmm. had against the U.S. Yeah. And, it's, uh, like when, when Kevin Dur- it's like when Kevin Durant injured his leg. In the playoffs. Oh the yeah, Raptors, right, right, right. And, and the Toronto fans are like, yeah, right, right, yeah. right. Yeah. Great example, yeah. great example. And then the more sensible, you know, on the Raptor side is like, okay, hey, exactly. like we don't okay. don't do that. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, but that's a really good analogy because you know my my adversary is injured, is hurt, exactly. And so that makes me stronger, makes me better because they're weaker. Mm. Yeah. So, but of course, unfortunately, I mean, after that second plane hit, I, I knew that this was no accident. This was very deliberate, and uh, so, the, so after the first one, you're thinking, "Oh my God, like this is crazy." You're not thinking this is intentional whatsoever. No, not at all. There's well, no, no one was. Right. No one was. Right. I remember, in, I was in college. I was in in my class, and a teacher left for a time. Like someone called the teacher, and he came back in, and he said, uh, "A plane just hit the World Trade Center," and I remember, I'll never forget. Everyone was like, "Huh?" You know, because there was no image attached to it. Everyone's trying to, uh-huh. and and all I remember is. 80% of the class didn't know what the World Trade Center was. And all, all you can hear is like, is that, you know, New York City? And everyone's just trying to describe it. Right. No one had internet on their phone. So there was no reference 
to like really quickly show it. And in the midst of that, that's when we found out that mm-hmm. the second one hit. Yeah, I I, uh, I lived nearby my workplace. I remember driving back and uh, my wife was watching TV like intently and she even kind of made this like dark joke. You know, she's like, you sure you don't have anything to do with this? Because like the phone is ringing off the hook. And it was my friend's calling the house like so you know my non-muslim friends basically calling and saying mubin you know is this is this what you've become is this what your religion is about oh my goodness and then my wife's fielding the phone calls yeah and then my muslim friends who i knew from before were like mubin this is not our religion this is not what we're about wow so it was a real um you know it forced that re-evaluation of what i got myself (laughs) involved in and like the kind of rhetoric that i was engaging in and and so uh, I realized that... Did any of those words penetrate? I mean, no, you know, oh, random yeah, phone calls. Like, where are you at that? Because like, at some point, it's like a stronghold. It's something that... And by that, I mean something that kind of skews your mind. Something that it's, it's not in balance. It's mm-hmm. not healthy, the thinking. Is there any specific word that penetrated? Or was it maybe the thrust of all of them that at some point pressed against you? I, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, as that day went on, because so it's so I mean I was at work there was this you know dynamic at work where people were all you know in distress uh, psychologically you could see that because of what had happened mm-hmm. then I get to I went to my house during lunchtime then I finished work and then at in the evening I went to go and see the bad friends right the bad Muslim guys mm-hmm. and uh, that's where everything basically came became very clear because one of my friends, he asked uh, the ringleader or the mouthpiece of, of our friend group there uh, that he was like, yeah, but I understand, you know, fighting the enemy, whatnot, but like, how do you justify flying a plane into a building, which is not even a military target, like mm-hmm. civilians, just business people going to work and stuff. Right. Mm-hmm. And there was a pause, right, where you can, you know, you can smell the wood burning, right, because Buddy's trying to come up with an answer to appear that he, to sound knowledgeable. Yes. And and all he ended up saying was, well, they're all kufar anyway, so it doesn't matter, like infidels. Yeah. And like we both looked at each other with this, like, hmm, like that that just doesn't make sense. Yeah. And you know, for especially again in the, the radicalization discourse and de-radicalization discourse, there's usually never one event. And if it is going to be one event, it's going to be a major uh, traumatic event that everyone is seeing, right? Um, so. So I really, I look on that time, that moment, is when I realized this is, this is not right. Mm-hmm. There's something fundamentally wrong about this. So I realized that I didn't, I didn't know Arabic, I didn't know Islamic studies, I hadn't studied any of this stuff formally. So, uh, so in, the, in early 2002, I resolved even um, shortly after 9-11 that I was going to go and study Arabic and Islamic studies. And uh, I ended up choosing Syria of all places to to go and do that Mm -hmm. sold my car got rid of all my furniture sold everything collected what i could and just basically up and went and moved to syria spent two years there um i was introduced to uh sufi islam sufism uh, which is basically the sufis are like the jedis of the muslim world okay Mm -hmm. and like the wahhabis are like the sith Okay. Right. It's yeah. a great way to explain it. Well, that's yeah. a great. Okay. Uh, I, I know exactly what you mean. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and spent two years there, and basically, where the scholar, you know, scholars, debunked my interpretations that I had come to subscribe to, basically showing me where I went wrong and why. Uh, and so I would spend two years there. Got fed up, uh, and basically came back to Canada, and that's when I would become the walk-in for the Canadian Security Intelligence Service. Wow, man. You know, oh it's, it's, that's crazy. So even in the moment when you go back, they're basically saying, we've lost our brother. Let's bring him back in. Let's show him the way. Let's show him why. And you were able to basically fight through all that. Navigate like, through Navigate through, through it and make sense of it and be like, this is not right. Mm-hmm. I mean, that, that's pretty incredible. How often does that happen where people are in your situation, but they get led right back in again? Does that happen? You know what I mean? Like yeah, if I mean either it's like think about it like belonging to a gang, right? It's yes. no different. Right? Same, I mean, same dynamic. Same dynamic. Same dynamic. Yeah. I mean, your sense of meaning, belonging, identity is rooted in your membership in that group. Yeah, a okay. power, a power group yeah. again. Right? Power group again, exactly. Yeah. 
I mean, we felt like we were the downtrodden Muslims, right? We right. To be, we did become like a Muslim gang. Yes. Right. Uh, and even today, you have like gangsters out there right now. Like they call themselves gangsters. They think they're gangsters, right? You know, there's one, you know, halal halal gang or something. You know what I mean? Halal means lawful. Yes. And pure and good. Okay. Right? It's like kosher. Yes. It, it's it's the yes. it's exactly yes. the same as kosher. Exactly. How you how you uh, street gang you call yourself halal gang. Yeah. <laughs> but the yeah. thing is again is they're tapping into these uh these these markers, right? Right. Uh, the religiosity, the the ethnic group or whatever it is. So, I mean, um I, I think uh you know, they, the, for a lot of people, I don't think they get... Once you've convinced yourself that the group is full of shit, there's no, there's no going back. Yeah, I it's mean, like it becomes very clear. You're out, yeah. If it won't happen right then and there, I mean, it'll happen shortly thereafter. Yeah. So one of the first things that... Um, and we were introduced to you by um, Ron Chinzer, right? Yeah. Yeah. Who? Ron, Ron Chinzer? No, da- Derek. Oh, oh, uh, oh, yeah. Oh, my yes. goodness. Rourke. Mixing it up. Yes. Yeah, yeah. yes, yes, yes. Sorry. We're just getting cross referenced. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. One of the Phew. first. Yeah, yeah. I was yeah. like, what? Yeah. Uh, Ron is a, he's a part of the Guns and Gangs unit. Yeah, that's why that, okay. I brought that thought when and you mentioned gangs. Yeah, oh, right, an yeah. expert on gangs and everything. So okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, you guys should meet, though. Yeah, yeah. An element for sure. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, one of the very first things that came through my mind was like, oh, my goodness. What a story. This guy's now helping CSIS right now basically look for those to do these things right yeah and then my mind right off to be right off the bat of course having security background is are you safe right. in the situation because right now you're going on the complete other side right now almost like do you feel like going in that area would put a target on you in the sense of where you know what i mean because you're literally oh, not yeah. going again so i mean <laughs> that, I know that's scary mean. in itself you talk about leaving a gang i mean uh, a lot of gangs leave gangs you're, oh, you, yeah. you get marked for yeah. leaving gangs. so like right. how was that man like to deal with something like that now where you're i'm about to take this next step on the other end of the uh, of the spectrum and yeah and actually undercover to be yeah. undercover yeah it's a good question uh because when i when i decided i was going to go to syria to study uh, the bad guys who were here thought I was going to escalate. Hmm. They thought, oh, this guy's going overseas now. Like, what is he doing? What is he What is he going to do while he's over there? Um, so they didn't know that, that I had this change of mind, change of heart. So I get, I get over there. I spend my years there. Um, and when I come back, they think that... You know, they don't know what to think, really. Most people, they didn't know what to think. And I know some people were trying to check on me to see, like, what was this guy doing over there? Who was he with? So, like, people were able to verify that, in fact, I was there and I was at this, you know, Islamic university. And, you know, I wasn't, like I said, I, I didn't go there to engage in any anything else. I just wanted to go and study. Um, but But I was thinking that if the Great War kicked off while I was there, mm-hmm. I would participate. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Thank God that that didn't happen. Yeah, It did end up happening, that is, this war, but 10 years after, yeah. in 2010-ish. Okay. Uh, and, and by then I had come back, like, and I don't know what the hell, what, you know what I mean, what, what the regime would have been doing to me and my family. Uh, right. So I came back in uh, 2004, and the first week that I'm back, I look at the newspaper, and on the front page is a guy by the name of Mo'min Khawaja. Mo'min Khawaja is the first Canadian arrested on terrorism charges in our post-9-11 terrorism legislation. Mm -hmm. Mo'min Khawaja sat beside me in that Quran school I went to as a kid. Wow. I grew up with this kid. We used to play Hot Wheels cars together. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Wow. Right? And uh, unbeknownst to me, he had been caught up because I'm reading it in the article now, but he got caught up, like I said, in a in a in the 2004 London fertilizer bomb plot, where he was making the detonator for these group for these guys who were in the UK. So I call up. Remember those things called phone books? Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I go I go to the back yes. of the phone book, look up Canadian Security Intelligence Service, they call him up, and say, "Hey, this guy that you arrested, this has to be a mistake." Now, I had no idea the way that the differences in mandates work with CSIS versus RCMP. CSIS doesn't arrest anybody. They're not police. 
and and the RCMP do the federal policing part, especially with national security investigations, and then it goes to court, and then the courts deal with it. So I didn't know any of this, but so and then CSIS was like, oh well, since you're calling us about this guy, uh, you know, and I thought they were gonna be like, where are you uh, this Friday or like in a few days? They're like, so where are you gonna be in the next hour and a half? Because uh, you know we would like to send somebody to come and talk to you. So I was like, oh okay, now. Understand something. I had just spent two years in Syria, mm. a real police state. When I the first thing I did when I got there is I registered with the embassy, and I let them know I'm here with my family. This is where I live. Mm-hmm. If shit hits the fan, take us home. Um, so that really worked well in my favor because when they did do background checking on me, trying to you know locate and verify and all that, that stuff. Lo and behold, I had come into the embassy, so they're like, oh, well, clearly this guy's not trying to hide. Right. Yes. We didn't need to go and find out, you know. So so anyways, the, the CSIS officer came over, and he was a manager in one of their units, um, and basically just put to me the prospect that, hey, well, I like the way you think. You know, you have access to that community, that the vulnerable and at-risk community. Uh, we would like for you to consult for us. That's that's the way they phrased yes. it. How old are you exactly here? You're 20, 20 So it's 2004, yeah. So Okay. So it's like 26? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, just before 18, 26, I yeah. guess. Um so yeah, and then uh for uh you know, for a few years after that, a couple of years, uh I just did undercover operations. Uh it was on like a human infiltration as well as uh, online uh, password protected chat forums. Mm-hmm. And this is, a, if you can imagine a time, this is before social media. Mm. This is before Facebook and Twitter and all that crap. Uh, they, had, uh, there was, they had password protected chat forums. So you needed to know somebody physically in order for that person to give you a password that you could then use on your computer at to home. To give you access. To yeah. give you access. And it was all all filled with jihadi videos, uh, the war in Chechnya, all beheading videos. Wow. This, this stuff was coming out like years and years ago. Um, and so so basically that's what I did for two years with the service. Um, and then one day, like every other day, when they give me a tasking, uh, they just said to me, listen, there's a bunch of guys. Uh, they're meeting up at this place. Tell us what they're about. So, you know... Case in point, was it 2006, the Toronto 18? Yeah, so that's that's what I'm uh, that's what I'm leading to there. So that's what became the Toronto 18 case. Oh, it see. started off as a CSIS investigation. Yeah. Um, and again, like they showed me, these are these are the guys. Tell us what they're about. Now, so there was a so um, November 25th, uh, 2005. Uh, I was tasked to go to this place and meet these guys. And sure enough, these guys showed up, and I became buddy buddies with them, just you know, shooting the shit, and uh, trying to infiltrate and find out like what's going on. So first, I was just developing rapport with them, mm-hmm. uh, and until they started to kind of ramp up the rhetoric, started to like in, try to indoctrinate me or recruit me, basically, uh, you know, invoking the grievances of the Iraq War. Uh, invoking the grievances of the Afghanistan war, you know, that the Canadians went in Afghanistan, yep. uh, the Americans went in Iraq, and because the Canadians are allies of the Americans and the Canadians are fair targets, there right? You Very, you can see that <laughs> gymnastics, mental gymnastics that they go through. Yeah, the creative math yeah. process yeah. of deduction, yeah. <laughs> so basically they ended up telling me, inviting me to this training camp that they had proposed and planned, and... Um, asked me to come in and, and train their people uh, you know, at this camp and bring them to a level of capability where they could conduct really a, a section-level attack on uh, you know, a, some various targets, any kind of target, really. Mm-hmm. A little bit later, they did try to uh, narrow down their focus and, and come up with a specific plot. Um, but, but in the beginning, that's how it started. And uh, so I remember that day very, very vividly because I remember calling the, the, the controller and saying, uh, this guy is an effing time bomb waiting to go off. Yeah. And, and again, the, these guys had, they had uh, organized their group. They had decided that they were going to have this training camp. They had selected the training camp site. The ringleaders visited the site 
uh, invited all the people to the camp, all of this before I was sent in to infiltrate the group. Because I, I, I was, you know, hammered over accusations of entrapment. Yes. Because a lot of people don't understand how undercover operations work, right? Like the mere presence of an undercover doesn't equal entrapment. And there is only one way to gather evidence uh, of, of covert criminal wrongdoing, and that is through covert collection. Okay. So, uh, but of course, uh, you know, uh, the, the operation ran about six months, let's say. So I was operational with the RCMP. I traversed now over to the RCMP as what's called a police agent, um, basically given immunity to commit terrorist offenses, which, which just means, like, what? Mm-hmm. Uh, no, it just means that I can basically be a part of a group that is plotting and planning and whatever else. So uh, it ran for six months. June 2006, the hammer fell. 18 people got arrested. There was a huge, you know, huge media story, a lot of media coverage. Mm-hmm. Uh, in some respects, I would say a little bit too much of the coverage, a little too much theater. Yeah. Um, can you give an idea of what was collected? So it collected, you know... Yeah, so it really comes down to uh, the same thing. Two things: uh, technical intercepts and uh, human, uh, you know, human uh, eyewitness. So I'm the human source. I give the fact witness testimony. Mm-hmm. Then you have the technical intercepts, and technical intercepts are two types. One is uh, uh, basically an audio recording. So you know, the the work car, quote unquote, yep. that I would drive with uh, was you know wired six ways to Sunday. And all those conversations were recorded into an audio format. Then you did also have some video uh, uh, of different aspects of it. So, you know, after we went shopping for supplies for the camp, you know, there was a there was an, another undercover who was in the vehicle and he was doing like a covert filming. Uh, for okay. Me. So you didn't have to film yourself per se. Uh, I didn't have to film myself. The only thing I will say is, at some points. I did wear a body pack mm. uh, to to record my interactions with certain people. Mm-hmm. Are you nervous doing this? Like I, I don't want in the moment because it's kind of like what if they ca- what if yeah. they find out it's something you know that I'm doing this undercover? Yeah, we've all seen the movies where it goes yeah. awry. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And you see the wire it yeah, sticks course. out. You know, absolutely. That is how they do it, don't you yeah. know? It's yeah. a wire just taped to the chest. Yeah, yes. yeah. I want everyone out there to realize that that is how it is done, just yeah. like in the movies. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it was funny because um, one of the guys we were about to stand up for prayer in the in the masjid, and uh, the guy came up to me and starts patting me on my back and doing oh, like circles goodness. and stuff. And I'm like, yo, why is this guy so touchy feely with me? Right? Yeah. Like he's not he's not like that, right? Yeah. And I realized this guy's trying to figure out if I have a wire on me. Yeah. Wow. And, and and I did. Wow. <laughs> okay. And I was just like, huh. You know, like, what do I do now if, uh, you so know. So you pretended to be extremely ticklish. <laughs> yeah, I kind of. laughing hysterically. Well, I, I and made. And started tickling him back. <laughs> no, I, I made. <laughs> As a ploy to just divert away from. Oh. <laughs> Can you imagine? Well. That's a, that's a good movie scene, right? Like, sure, sure. Yeah. I did I did kind of <laughs> one, one, one step better, which was. I was like, brother, are you getting a little, uh, a little too frisky. You yes. know what I mean? Yeah. You know, and just like, especially for them, if you were to kind of like, yeah, y- you could u- insult them by suggesting, yes. right, "What are you gay?" Yes, 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 right? yes. And then you say that to him in the mosque. Yes. yes. Say a little bit out loud, and yeah. like he's finished, right? Yeah, like exactly. So I was just, I was just playing it off. Right? Yeah. Frisky. It's yeah. a good wow. Word. Yeah. Okay. L- let's just put this out right now. <laughs> yeah. Let's say you felt something. Mm-hmm. What, what do you think would have happened? Like, like okay, you, okay. Let, let's let's use the scenario. Let's say if he if he felt the body pack. Right? Yeah, that's what we that's what you're talking yeah. about. Yeah. Yeah. Felt something. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> yes. The body package. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, if uh, okay, let's see how quickly we es- uh, escalate. Right. Yeah. right? Um, if if he did start to really focus on it, and now he knows there's something there, and then his demeanor changes, you know, I would try to do whatever, like, yo, leave me alone, man. This is right. just my belt buckle or yeah, whatever. Exactly, it's like. yeah. But if it keeps going to the point where, you know, he, what, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. about to reveal, you kick him in the face is what you do, right? No, right. Something extreme. Yeah, right? yeah it's going to be very extreme. Yeah, it yeah. would probably be like, a you know, some kind of really quick strike to the throat. Yeah, you know, so you can't just talk. to disable him or, yeah. or like really... 
not just not talk, but like give him that because you know that feeling like when you get hit in that voice box yeah. with oh, the, yeah. just like a ridge yeah. hand or a yeah. quick little pop to the throat. No, I was thinking, I was thinking it hurts. pop his throat and then you'd run and then while well, people are asking him, what, yeah, what happened, brother? Like, what happened? <laughs> you can't yeah. talk. You know, he yeah. he buys but you the, more but time. The, but the thing is, this is going in your head regardless because you're like thinking, what if this happens? What am I going to do? Oh yeah, like, yeah. I, where are my exits? What? Yeah. Where, oh, where that that was always that was always covered. I mean, I. Uh, so what's interesting? Let me put it this way. So with with CSIS, yeah, uh, you're on your own, right? Like you, uh, you are. It's only you and your wits. Right? Wow. There's no. There's no help. Is not coming. It's up to us. So right? they can, they can listen to everything. Nobody can hear anything. Oh wow. So let me let me say this with. Ceases. I didn't wear a body pack. Okay. okay? Uh, nor was I. <laughs> you know, I've been through court. All right. So yeah. when I, nor was I required to conduct any recordings of any conversations that I may or may not have had. Yes. <laughs> um, with the RCMP, of course, very different because now it's court evidence collection. Yes. Right? Yes. So with them, it, there's a body pack, um, and while there is not any, there's no real time uh, um, uh, intercept. Right. Uh, like when I'm in the mosque, they don't know what's going on. They're gonna wait for me to come out. Wow. They're they're in there. They're waiting, hidden somewhere. Right. And then when I get out of the mosque or whatever wow. place I'm at, then yes. you know when the day is over, we had a whole routine, right? Like we would go and we had a safe house that we would end up going to because I had to type up the reports right. that day. Right. Because they had to be timely reports. Yes. Because when you're when you're testifying to it in court, they're gonna ask you. When did you write those reports? Yes. Was it immediately thereafter? Right. Because if you wait too long, oh, you might have forgotten exactly. something, blah, blah, blah. Yes. Uh, so so we had this whole thing, uh, you know, scripted out in that sense. But when I'm in the building or I'm with these people, even though I have a body pack, it's just recording. Mm. All right? That's all it's doing. Yes. So nobody knows what's going on. So if shit hit the fan, they would just see me come running out of the door. <laughs> yes, yes, you know, yes. And that's it, right? Okay. And uh but uh, it, it would have required an extreme reaction for sure. Wow. I was ready to yeah. do whatever I had to do. Like, I mean, and plus, I've done a lot of, uh, I've done Muay Thai and uh, some uh, Jiu Jitsu and stuff like that. So yes. I was comfortable. Yes. Yeah, if something uh, happened. Yeah, if something happened. Like, these guys weren't exactly, you know, scrappers or whatever. Right? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Um, you can yeah. say words like frisky and they'll back off. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, no, yeah. I just, you know. So we have it now. So look, the series is The Collectors. The Collectors. And then a the spin off is Covert. The yeah. covert collectors, <laughs> and then the, the next spinoff is the court collectors. Yes. Right? We think. Well, you know. <laughs> there is a, there is a show coming. Um, so really, Man, yeah, see, yeah. <laughs> man, someone always beats you. Yeah? But I like the I like the title collectors. Yeah. Uh, I hope you mentioning it on the show is is not copyright. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, 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 no. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, no, I'll, I'll hook you guys up. Though, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, you know this uh, this segment of uh, standing yeah. in the six brought to you by <laughs> right. yeah. <laughs> Basically, I mean, so let me let me now. What's happened? I know I know I'm kind of jumping ahead a little bit, but I'll, I will come back to it. Uh, I've done a lot of media stuff, and I've been yes. very public about what I've been doing, and so different uh, corporations have gotten in touch with me, and uh, military uh, units, and and Hollywood. And I didn't want to make a story about my life. And I'm like, I'm not into that, right? Like, I want to kind of give credit back to people who are doing this stuff on the daily without any limelight, yes. right? Mm -hmm. It's all in the shadows. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we're working on a show. Uh, I think I can mention the name. Uh, it's going to be called The Assets. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's basically going to be in the context of, of covert counterterrorism, so yeah. on and so forth. So I don't know if I and that's the lingo, right? When when discussing someone, yeah, 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 we have an yeah. asset in right yes, Toronto. Yes, yes. So if you imagine, uh, I don't know if you've seen, we have an asset in the six. Yeah, yeah. Contact me. Yeah. yeah, okay. Essex, no Essex. Essex. Yeah, it's short form. <laughs> yeah. Uh, anyways, He's friends with Drake. He's friends with Drake. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, the Bodyguard. It yes. was a uh, Netflix show. Bodyguard. Yes, yes, yes. It's a really, really good. Really show, good right? show. Have you seen it? I haven't. It's seen the one it that yet. Joe's talking about. Yeah, I heard. Okay. UK. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yes. So Come we're on. gonna we're gonna basically so we're working with I think the producer of that show. Okay. Or maybe it's another show. I maybe I might be getting confused. But we're gonna do a similar type of show, like six episode series. Wow. Uh, event. Right. Yes. Uh, so so and you know, all based you know, on true story, man. Uh, no, this one will be fictionalized. Okay. Okay. Uh, it will use real people though. Like, I mean, yeah, basic so, stuff, right? Yeah. Like we, we want to keep it ambiguous so that they can't be identified of or obviously or all that stuff. But, um, but the, 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 I think the selling point that they're trying to use here is that 
they have an executive consultant me yes on the show which all of these shows don't have mm. yeah and then when when people like us watch these shows I, I don't know how often it happens to you like it happens to me all the times like that's bullshit that's wrong that's right. not true right yeah. you know it's like doesn't work that way yeah i, I love the uh, surveillance you know right in front of the house like directly across the street <laughs> and they're like they're looking they're looking through the side of the car yeah. and the guy yeah. comes out he looks all around yeah. and it's like you don't see the car right in front of you <laughs> and the two guys sitting in it staring right at you okay, right. Yeah, okay. all right this yeah. is where if they did a white oh, shot if, it kills if there was me. if there's an establishing shot you'd see the cars like 20 feet from the front door yeah right? it's right. just <laughs> stuff like that drives me nuts right like yeah. never-ending <laughs> magazines you know yeah. of, of, of Yes. Yeah, it never ended. It's either. like, I was <laughs> yeah. like, all right, you know. Yeah. But so basically. Or the, or the 51 round, you know, just like. Sure, the, yeah, exactly. Yeah, never sure, ending sure, magazines. Sure. I love those. I need one of those. Please, yeah. two, please. Yeah. Yes. Like, I can only suspend belief for so long until right. it's just you blatantly. Lost me. You lost me. Yes. I, I can't. I can't do it. So I'm, I'm hoping to kind so of bring that. you're going to keep the integrity of, of, the, of these. Yeah, I want to bring yeah. some more realism to it. Yeah. Uh, but sometimes I might need to falsify because they might get it really right. And you don't also want to be giving Ooh, away copy trade cat. secrets. Yeah, yeah. So, so there's yeah. that responsibility as well. Uh, but if I can just come back to the trial yes, 18. Man. Let's uh, do it. Let's do yeah. it. Uh, just uh, basically, so I was operational for about six months uh, collecting. You asked the question, what was collected? So it was all these technical intercepts. Uh, it was, of course, my own evidence, eyewitness testimony. And then June 2006, the hammer fell and the 18 guys got arrested in total. Uh, I would then spend four years in court in five legal hearings. Wow. Uh, prosecuting these uh, these individuals. So we had a youth preliminary hearing or two. So one youth preliminary hearing, uh, January 2007. Adult preliminary hearing, September 2007. Uh, trial. So after the preliminary hearings, uh, some of them start to plead guilty because they're like, mm -hmm. oh, shit. This like, is going nowhere. Oh, this yeah. is good. I mean, yeah. there's what's so it, much evidence. What's the general age range of the 18 of them? Really weird. You know, there's one guy that was really old. He was like in his 50s. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but the vast majority of them were between the ages of, well, so there were four young offenders, uh, four who were under the age of 18, mm. and 14 who were above the age of 18. Okay. But only one was in his 50s. The the adults, quote unquote, was from 18 to about 22, 23. Wow, so relatively so. young. Really yeah, young. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So the 50 year guy, I guess he was just. He was. He was a loser. Yeah, a slower he, learner. He was just a loser in his community, yeah. and uh, he was always. Uh, railing against uh, Canadian forces because of what they had done in Afghanistan, and uh, and and everybody else kind of saw him as the local kook. Mm -hmm. um, but these young guys, they saw him as a brother in arms. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So so spent all this time giving testimony. Uh huh. And uh, and then when I was done, uh, 2010, the case was done. I got onto social media, Facebook, Twitter. I was very public about who I was. You know, I didn't go into witness protection. Uh, why should I? I'm I'm from Toronto. Like, yeah. why would I leave my city and cut off all my friends? Because some people are upset of you know because of what I did. Right? I'm not going to be apologetic for what I did, right? I I do it ten times again if I give, was given the ch the mm -hmm. choice. So, um, so uh, basically, I uh, got onto social media, put my public profile out there. Went through a lot of, you know, uh, pushback, of course. A lot of people were and are still in denial of, of the case in general. Uh, it was really the, the usual arguments of entrapment. It was all entrapment. You yep. made them do it. You did everything. And it was just like some people, you know, they just, they're not going to believe no matter what you you, you show them. Yeah. But then, uh, then um, the Syrian war kicked off. Uh, the Arab Spring was happening. And then ISIS and so I would then spend the years of 2012, 13, 14, and 15, 16, and finally 17. But it took me about a year and a half to extricate myself from it. I basically spent those years online debating and tracking and trolling ISIS. Wow. I saw the rise of ISIS in real time. I, wow. I I made these fake profiles to yeah. see if they would get recruited by ISIS. Yeah, they did. Yeah, I had my own public profile where I was like always like you know uh, harassing them and uh, uh, like I said tracking some of them and trolling them using really my experience coming from this extremist mindset. Yeah, talking you know, their language. Talking basically. their language, yeah. man. Talking yeah. their language. Yeah. 
And it was at this time that oh, I, fascinating. You know, I really got in touch with the U.S. State Department and U.S. Special Operations Command. And uh, from those years, did a lot of work with those agencies against ISIS. So you heard it here fo- first. You heard it here first. Yeah. Trolling can be used for good. Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> well, there's this, if I just, there's this hilarious, I, I do this presentation uh, for the military now, uh, and it's called basically, I call it terrorism in Islamic costume. Mm. All right, because I don't like the phrase radical Islamic terrorism because the word Islamic is used incorrectly as an adjective. Okay. Uh, but because the adversary does appeal to the Islamic sources, you need to have the word Islamic. So I put terrorism in Islamic costume. Basically what I do is I, I show all the tweets that ISIS followers and recruiters used to lure people. For recruitment. Yeah, for recruitment. It's funny, like I do wow. have a, like dark humor, right? It's a it's yeah, a coping same, mechanism. Same, same. And uh, it's funny because on, on one of the, you know, it gets real serious. You know, ISIS is saying it's not about the number of people killed; it's about the number of people watching. So the whole idea of terrorism as theater. Mm, yep. And then as as it goes on, there's like Ask FM. It's a platform where people were asking, you know, if I come, how much money should I bring? What kind of uh, you know uh, clothes and so on and so forth. And then I switched to the next line and says, are there good-looking women there? Hmm. <laughs> right? Yeah. And then even with the ladies, you know, on the female side, female recruitment and, and women ISIS, if you will, there's this thing that says, uh, I just wanted to get my piece of eye candy. And it's basically attractive jihadists luring female fighters. Wow. Right? Like our female members yes, to join. Yes. So, so anyway, so I, just, I go through this whole thing and, uh, and I basically, I, I use the Islamic sources to debunk uh, the extremist uh, narratives and whatnot, um, and um, yeah, it just it just really exposes how they were recruiting, yeah. how they use the internet, how internet companies, you know, they have no sense of responsibility. They allow these people to, you know, be on their platforms. Like we look at now, right, with all this white supremacist attacks that are happening in the U.S. and forums like 8chan and 4chan and whatnot. And it's like, it's frustrating, right? Because it's like, there is a way to stop them. Like, don't give them a platform, right? Mm -hmm. People say, oh, if you, this is the case. This is great debate right now because of freedom of speech, right? That the platforms aren't government. And if you were to de-platform someone who is throwing Mm -hmm. out hate rhetoric, that, you know, no one would know how dangerous they are. Because there's Mm -hmm. an element for the majority of people would be, oh, that guy's an, an extremist, or mm-hmm. supre- white supremacist, but if it's cloaked or certain things are hidden from what they post, it's not like you know. Once you start controlling that, where does it stop? Okay. Yeah, I, I mean, even at this time, because uh, my business partner right now, he's an ex CIA guy, and uh, you know, we we talked about this, and the dilemma is, because especially in the uh, during the ISIS heyday, the dilemma was that if we take all these guys offline, we don't know where they are. We don't know what they're doing, yeah. who they're talking to, what platforms they're using. And so, as, and as Jeff Goldblum says famously in Jurassic Park, nature finds a way. Mm. <laughs> right? I mean, that's the right, truth. Right, right, right. Look Very at jails, good. anything. Like, think that's of jails. Right, right. They have the, the ultimate surveillance. I mean, they literally have right. nothing, and they still find a way. Right. They fashion. They get incredibly creative. They say creative genius is, at, is, at a, is actually birthed out of limitation. Mm-hmm. So the more you limit an avenue or a resource the more creative they get mm-hmm. and the more it goes underground and the harder it is to figure out yeah there's an yeah. element of that i mean not yeah. saying I, I i do agree with it yeah i do agree with it because i mean i saw that i mean the even cia guy was saying he's like look shake he's like if we if we if we turn the lights out then we can't see anything either and if you leave them on yeah okay a few people might get recruited by them but we are going to map the hell out of their network. That's a great way of saying if you turn the lights out. Yeah. Yeah. And then we're going to go with some guys we tracked and a whole bunch of guys we whacked. Mm. Yeah. That's how it went. Right. Because yeah. if you don't, if you can't track them and yeah. map them, yes. yeah, how are you going to hit them? That's it's right. true. That's right. That's, so. not, that's a principle in close protection. Yeah. yeah. You can't hit a target you don't see. Right. right. So there's an element of cloaking your principle, yeah. right, whoever your VIP is. So. Interesting. Wow, man. Wow. So here we are in 2019. Yeah, yeah, and, and uh, have you have you completely pulled out of even that piece now with CSIS, or are you still? Yeah, like- I'm. I'm no longer with. Uh, I mean, on my work with the service ended way back. Would have been the end. Of, well, technically, or, or I should say, legally, 
I traversed over to the RCMP December 2005. Okay. And then the case ran till June 2006. Yes. And then it was over. Okay. okay. And then so I, uh, I, I have no formal uh, ties with them yes. since then. It was interesting because it, it a year after the case was completed mm. is when this was when CSIS reached back out to me just to say, hey, buddy, how you doing? Is everything good? Wow, man. And uh, so... Wow. So what's your role with the RCMP right now? We were talking nothing, earlier. man. I'm yeah. I'm I'm an independent consultant. Yes. I I love where I sit. Yes. Amazing. Yeah, I love where I am. Yes. I I I don't. I respect the uh, the institutional mandates that these organizations have to be under. Um, but boy, am I glad I'm no longer part of that yeah. because it allows you to do what you want. You know, uh, work with who you want. Uh, freelance yeah that's, all that, that's what yeah, it's man. about yeah and also you're, you're a pivotal piece to to making a difference in someone like someone's gonna listen to this or has listened to uh you know one of your past uh you know uh workshops or meetings or, or conversations about what to avoid man i mean you're almost like it's it's a real big service what you're doing and i commend you on that man that's yeah, amazing it's, incredible. It's, it's huge it's huge yeah Thank you. you know the, in, the information is key you know what is the data that you work with you know mm-hmm. uh, having access to it can change anything absolutely you, you know, it can change in your life so it's amazing that you're you're equipped in uh, special ops and police and uh, mm-hmm. giving them the information that they need you know from the inside out yep. yeah yeah that's totally like, like we're not talking about making a TV series no you for know, you're sure. seeing certain producers on the outside say you know what let's do this and they don't have it they don't get it right and yeah. look there's we're a lot ta- of we're talking real life yeah and yeah. And, and you know human life Homeland Security, you have to get those things right. You need yeah, to know how for to work. Sure. And there's probably a lot of people that were, if they were in your situation, wouldn't do nothing about it. Mm-hmm. I mean, no, it I w- happens. I, I want to say it something. Happens a lot. You know, there's, there is, a, we know this. We, get, we have busy lives. There's an element where we don't feel that any of this r- relates to me. Right. You know, I, I'm, I'm enjoying other shows on Netflix. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, I was saying before we jumped on today that... Um, what is it again? C N B R E C B R N E C B C B R N E, which stands for chemical, biological, radiological, e- nuclear, explosives. E? Right. Yeah, and there was a police truck that was in Yorkville. So okay. this is we kind of film in and around this area, and literally, I'm not even joking. Two hundred meters from where we're se- seated, this truck was there last night, and they were investigating a pickup truck that had a driver. Gentleman uh, was Caucasian handcuffed and for whatever reason he was swarmed by police it, it was calm in the sense of nothing was happening with you know he was already cuffed and seated in his own pickup truck but uh this uh, truck came to do probably on-site testing of possible explosives but i was saying that in the midst of that you have people in yorkville <laughs> eating their gelato walking li- no, i'm not even joking yorkville's famous for people walking their dogs anywhere and they're, they're letting their little dogs go like up to the police <laughs> while the police are actually <laughs> wow. talking with it. You get what I'm saying? Like, yeah. And it's just such a dichotomy of two worlds, man. Like right yes. in the middle of like one of the, ju- like the, the crowning jewels of our city yeah. in terms of appeal and notoriety and yeah. just luxury. And you have this incident with this pickup truck. Right. And people are totally clueless. Like they, they yeah. didn't even realize what it is. No one thought to maybe Google the acronym on the police <laughs> truck. Yeah. Who knows? Yeah, people are very, very ignorant to, uh, I mean, oh, we're Canadians. Everything is so peaceful, yeah, yeah. love, peace and love, peace and love. Like, literally, they, they're they not realizing what's peace, out there. Peace, love, you and drink. I mean? yeah, hey, exactly. another show. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's crazy. Hey, that's, the next, that's a good title. Yeah, I mean, it's like, again... <laughs> You know, there's a lot of things. I know in you're place. listening, Drake. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. That's a good album title yeah. right there. There's, Peace, there's a, there's, love there's and a lot Drake. of things in place that are put there, like with the contributions of people like yourself that yes. are helping prevent mm-hmm. and and give people that safety. Yeah, can you yeah. speak on that? Just because I mean, you have an inside. Yeah. Canada's known worldwide has a reputation for working off intelligence. Yeah. And from a preventative sense. Yeah. You know, I we're mean, not patting each other on the back because we took them out. Yeah. Right. Right. Okay. Yeah. That's a it's a good observation. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, uh, there's a lot of stuff. You guys know this, of course, uh, as well. There's a lot of stuff that goes on behind the scenes, normal day to day stuff that people will never see. They will never see because it doesn't become anything. Right. That's what prevention is all about. Yes. And how do you quantify that? You can't you really. Can't. Right. It's impossible. Like this is the biggest big dilemma now with. 
you know, you know, in terms of investing in prevention programs, right? Whether it's like gun violence, gangs, extremism, terrorism, it's, you know, it's all kind of the same kind of violent extremism umbrella. But you can't quantify uh, prevention, right? All we, you know, we have adages like prevention is better than cure, right? Or an ounce of prevention is better than a pound of cure. Yeah. It's like, okay, but what does that translate into money, right? Like, mm-hmm. it, it's impossible. We yeah, can't, yeah, we can't do it. So, um, yeah, uh, uh, there's a lot of stuff that happens on a daily basis, which we will never hear about, especially stuff that's happening with CSIS itself, because it, it it's secret, right? It will never see the light of day unless it ends up in court, right? That's the only way that we'll know that something was going on. Yeah. So, you know, there are so many things that are prevented and... Um, you know, I should say one thing at least because I come from the Muslim community and there does seem to be a misunderstanding. A lot of people don't realize that, you know, and, and let me say two things here, right? Because I don't want to give you the the PR pitch either, right? I okay. don't bullshit, right? That's my superpower. Yeah, um, nice. You know, <laughs> oh, on, one, I, on one hand... I like that. That's good. <laughs> yeah. That's really good. On one hand, there is denial in some segments of the community, okay. yeah. right? They just, they, they refuse to believe that yes. there are bad people out to do bad things. Right, and and it's like a protection mechanism, right? They they want to see their community as pure and innocent, and no, and everyone is good, right? Exactly like a mom who refuses exactly. to accept. Exactly, right? That's exactly, little yes. Johnny. Yes. That's right. Yeah. That's no right. Way. Yeah, he's That's looking right. up skirts. Yeah, nope. right. yeah, yeah, yeah. Whatever. Okay. I didn't raise him that way. Yeah, exactly. exactly. There's no, no way. way. Yeah. He yeah. makes his bed in the morning. Yes. Okay. So there is some. There are some in the community because recently there was a story on. Uh, CSIS vi- visiting uh, U of T students okay. um, and a bunch of them getting real you know, upset that CSIS was showing up there and uh, asking people for information, whatever else. And I just I had to laugh, you know. They're like, "Oh, they're they're creating a hotline for Muslim students who are being approached by CSIS, this and that." I was like, "You need a hotline, a hotline. really?" It's like, "How many is this happening to?" It's like, "Oh, twelve people over the past eighteen months." Like, yeah. okay, <laughs> yes, that justifies that's, a hotline, that's does the it? Frequency, right. it? I think whatever. All right, but okay, let me not totally, you know, <laughs> totally make fun of them. I, I do laugh and chuckle and, and it's it's because I take it personally because these are also the people who accuse me of entrapment mm-hmm. and believe that, you know, there's no threat or the threat is inflated or whatever. But on the other hand, you have many people who are very cooperative. Um, you have Muslim intelligence officers, not just in CSIS, uh, but you have Muslim police officers in the RCMP, in the Canadian forces, mm-hmm. uh, and just community members who, if they hear something, they are going to call the authorities and they're going to say, listen, this guy... He's saying some weird stuff and da-da-da, maybe you should check him out. And now, just imagine this coming back to that comment I made about anonymous phone calls, right? Yes. These are the anonymous phone calls. And now CSIS has to leverage its sources and other undercovers to now verify that information. Yes. And that's how the system works. Okay. So th- that's this really the, the thing I wanted to just highlight is that while there are people who are uh, not cooperative, uh, there are many more that are. Yes. And, mm-hmm. and and never assume, right? Because like we need the help of communities. This is very important. Mm-hmm. Whenever I, I you know, it's funny when I was when I was the undercover and I dressed the way that I dressed, which is like an observant Muslim uh, look, uh, y- people they saw a terrorist. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm the, I'm actually the undercover. Yes. So never assume, you know what I mean? Right. Yeah. Never like, assume when you see somebody in garb or whatever, don't think that automatically, oh, they're extremists, they're terrorists. Yes, yes. yes. Right. And I like that reference, is Islamic costume. Yeah. There's something really accurate about that, mm-hmm. that you could apply across many things. Yeah. You know, yeah. it seems that's, you know, like a wolf in sheep's clothing, yeah. for example. Yeah. You know, don't give sheep a bad name. Mm. Yeah, okay. right. You know what I'm saying? Sheep are so nice. They're yeah. so nice. <laughs> <laughs> Look, Ben, I w- we want to thank you for coming today. Like, yes, yeah. most man, thanks. I, I, I feel like we could just keep going and going and going. <laughs> right. I think uh, we're gonna have to wait till this TV series com- comes out. Congrats yeah. on that. Yeah, thank it's you. amazing. It's amazing, man, that, like for how sure. things like that you can use a means of that type of storytelling to give insight. Uh, as an executive consultant on it, so we look forward to that mini series. Uh, yeah, we might know, we might need some VIP people. Come uh, on, hey, man! Come good. on, of course, Tell, show them how it's done. That's right, right man. Have That's you guys right. started filming it yet? 
No, no, okay. it's a, we're we're doing the pitches only in September 16, the week of September 16. Yes, we're in Hollywood. Yeah, it's uh, right after TIFF. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. TIFF ends on the 15th, so Hollywood will all be back in Hollywood. Yeah, yeah. So we might nice be there. Part. We might be in Hollywood. Possibly, yeah. possibly, yeah. Yeah, we'll yeah. see. Okay, gotta represent the six. Come on, yeah, man. let's go. On, Does, let's what is go. LA called? Uh, La La Land. Land. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Southland, La La Land. There's different ways. Yes, 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 yes. Does yes. it really matter? Yeah. We're just gonna scream Drake to the hills, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. right? And then That's ask right. the weekend to come from his house. And, and <laughs> there you go, man. <laughs> there you go. There. Move and shake. Thank you so much, yeah, brother. We appreciate you Thanks coming down, me. man. And uh, yeah, looking forward to like really, really uh, just seeing stuff like this change, change perceptions of all. Right on. Appreciate it, bro. Yeah. Thanks awesome. so much, man. Yeah. Thanks for coming, man. All the best, dude. Cheers, guys. Good night, everyone. Thank you. So. This podcast is brought to you by Executive Protection Lifestyle Canada. Make sure to drop by next week and don't forget to subscribe.